But I appreciate Block Physical Therapy being here as well because they I've heard so many great things about their programs and their efforts. And so for them to be going out into our communities to do educational programs like this beyond what they just do at their facility is so much appreciated. So I really am excited about the program that they're going to present. And I'm going to turn it over to them, let them introduce themselves, and tell a little bit more if you don't already know about their facility. Thank you. All right. So I try to come up with a catchy phrase that gets people interested. So, but I do believe that I don't care what our age is. I see people of all different ages, and it's amazing to me. Especially at 60, I see a very, very big transition that we start to have. The people who are active, somewhat healthy, that are a little bit taking care of themselves, how much better they do. And so, there's always genetic factors, obviously, and other issues. But maintaining a good, you know, just doing some basic, you know, the, the things that we know that we're supposed to do, it, it's not complicated to be in pretty good shape. And I think sometimes we don't realize how easy it is. It's just consistency. But when we hit 60, 65, 70, retirement, life changes, adults, now, now we have grandkids, we don't have these responsibilities necessarily that make us have to go do stuff every day. So life starts to change. And when life changes, we can either get really active and stay outside and stay engaged. Those people do incredible. Rarely do they have problems. The people that start to have, I like to read, I like to do, you know, sitting activities. The more we do sitting, the more sitting becomes what we do. I mean, it just really is such a common thing. And I see that, to me, if there's one thing that I could get people that's quit doing so much sitting, and, and you'll see when I talk about this a little bit, but there's actually called the sitting epidemic. Because we sit so much now, and you're seeing this even in high school kids and with their texting, so posture becomes such a big part. So I'll, I'm going to go through about how something as simple as sitting and some things we can do to change leads to postural changes, which lead to balance changes, which lead to breathing changes, which leads to just so many little issues. And it's just the simple stuff, but yet we spend so much time seeking medical treatment for the back pain that we have, everybody who spends more than five minutes has to hear, you know, I'll tell you why. I mean, but we get injections and all kinds of stuff, and images and x-rays, and of course we all have some things going on with our back and neck. But those are things that, you know, as we age, different things are going to happen. But there's really some simple things that we'll talk about how to, you're supposed to go like that. Right? <laughs> I was rambling there. But uh, um, some simple solutions to help you, because I think, I can sit here and preach about, and I've done this. I've been over 20 something years I've been doing this. And in the beginning I started out, you should eat perfect and do this and five small meals and do, you know. And that, you should, but most of all I'm gonna do that. So let's be real about what we can do that are some simple changes that can really make a big impact. And then what happens if you do that, you kind of feel better. And then maybe you wanna start doing what she's doing, and I've seen him too. And they start working out, and they see the benefit of that. And I joke with a lot of people when I see them in the gym, and they tell me, man, I, as soon as I start working out, I feel so good. I'm like, well, I said, Shh, don't tell anybody. Because <laughs> then I, everybody starts working out, I don't have any patience. You know? And I say, I don't make money on the gym side. Physical therapy, you know, that's where you have to supplement the healthy part. So anyway, we'll get rolling here. So let's, we'll go back to that real quick. If you can see that, it's kind of hard with the light here. That's my family. Um, I have a, my wife is a big part of the business as well. And we've had our practice in Fairfield for, we started in, I graduated in 97 from PT school. So over 20 years we've, I've had that. I've got a place in Corsicana also. Um, so we have about 35 employees, uh, 13, 14 PTs, doctors in physical therapy. Um, as a physical therapist, a little quick background, kind of to understand what, you know, doctor, phys, you know, I. Doctor Lot, that I'm a physical. I was kind of joking with people on the healthcare totem pole. I'm like just above the janitor, so um, and it's, it's kind of true. But I don't care really because um, I don't prescribe medicine. I, I really don't. You know, in Texas, we've just began to have direct access um, physical therapists. Even but with Medicare, you have to have your sign. It has to be um, a referral has to happen. So. In Fairfield, I know most of the doctors, and I know actually most of the doctors are probably all over the place. So a lot of times if I have somebody um, that needs physical therapy, 
they can come in for direct access without a referral, and then we send their information to the doctor and get it signed. Um, but some interest, insurances don't require any kind of referral at all. So that's a nice thing that we've been able to do lately, because that is become that becomes the barrier sometimes when somebody just wants some advice. But what I found, for the most part, most people don't even know what we do. So I'm interested. For those of you, how many of you have physical therapy before? Okay. So those of you who don't, can I pick on somebody? What do you think physical therapy is? What well, you exercising your muscles, maybe. Okay. Uh, All right. Body, you know, like, okay. I bet that's what I would say. And I haven't had that, but. It's, and, and what about you? What do you think? Same thing? Same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it's interesting. I just did a talk with a lot of doctors, and um, one of the things I found for the doctors is they're always wanting to refer patients to physical therapy, but what they found is when a patient's in pain and they say, you need to go do physical therapy, well, the patient's like, sorry, I'm, I'm in pain. I can't exercise. And I think that's the misconception. I think as physical therapists, we use a lot of different tools or interventions to help people get better, exercise being one of them. I probably don't do anywhere near as much exercise as I used to. I do more, to me, when you got up and walked to your car, that's exercise, that's movement. So it's more about corrective movement. So I'll get into more details later, but really our goal is to, if someone comes in, whatever their back, neck, knee, shoulder, whatever is, figure out what can we do to get them, get their pain down first. And a lot of times it's simple stuff. It's like, Maybe you're sitting in a bad position. Maybe you need to sleep differently. Maybe we need to do a little, maybe we need to do some movement. But sometimes it's a matter of identifying what you're doing too much of. Like if you're sitting, yes sir. I came to your, well, both of you, when I had my knee, I had metal knees. Uh -huh. And went through the therapy and uh, I have recommended your therapy to many people. It. Because if they do not do that after yeah. like the surgery, yeah, uh, they got a problem from then on. Yeah, you just have some expensive knees and you still can't do much with them, right? Yeah. 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 No, the thing of it is, you know, I don't hurt anywhere, yeah. but I can't walk straight. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's the thing with, the, with what we do with physical therapy. We'll talk about balance and posture and some other things in a little bit. But what I like to do is see somebody do an evaluation and then let's come up with a realistic game plan. Because we get to a certain point in life where we do, we have a accumulation of different issues. Maybe somebody has an inner ear issue or they have a, maybe they've had a stroke or they've had different things, but there's always ways to improve. And to me, a lot of times, there's also one of the most important things is to avoid getting worse, right? So if you have, like I can think of a lady I had not too long ago that had severe osteoporosis and had, I mean, she was just, but so, for me to think I'm going to get her walking straight and perfect is, is not realistic. But what we were able to do is figure out what we can improve and help her. We had to use some bracing and some different things, which I'll talk a little bit about that. But coming kind of with a simple game plan that she can do, and now she's able to maintain that. And But the best part of that is she's not going to get progressively worse quickly, because that's what happens. Like, for example, somebody who has a, even new knees, if you don't have a good strength program, get your motion back, and get walking pretty good. Well, if you got new knees and you're walking like this, you know, you still are at risk for falls and your knees hurt still. So um, anyway, I guess the point with physical therapy is a lot of probably what we do more than anything is education. Um, and it's important how when you know how to avoid like certain positions that can cause pain. You know, when you're, why do your hands go to sleep at night? You know, there's some simple things that I usually ask about 10 things and most of the time, it's there's little things we do during the day that like, oh, I didn't realize that that's what caused that. Because we don't have that time. When you go see your doctor, a lot of times you have five or 10 minutes. And instead of them having conversations about, okay, so your left hip hurts right here, how much sitting are you doing the day? Well, you know, it started three months ago and that's when I started, I quit working and I retired. And, you know, I sit and I like to cross my leg all day. And <laughs> so I might say, well, why don't we set up some times where during the day you do some simple hip movements. And simple things can totally change that because most of our pain comes from just bloating issues. But if you go to the doctor sometimes, they don't have time to go troubleshoot that and get an x-ray. Oh my gosh, you've got bone on bone and all this stuff. And um, so I like to ask, well, how long ago did your, your hips start bothering you? Because bone on bone didn't just happen overnight. So sometimes we get new pain that comes on, it might be a simple solution. But when you start doing x-rays, MRIs and all that, you can then get really make, make it think that you got these horrible things going on. 
But most of that stuff is pretty normal. Most of us have bulls and pigs and degenerative things that, is, that are happening. All right, we're going to move on. I'm going to be here all day. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, first identify the end. Bad mouth, bad posture, pain. What are some other things, when I say the enemy, like as we get older, what are the big things that you guys worry about? Is there any particular, as far as the physical function, you know, things like that? Is balance, falls, something that even comes on your radar? But for some people, they don't because they, they live a very simple, they, they sit in this chair every day, they go up to this part of the house and go here, and if you don't go outside that little world, then maybe you don't ever feel like you're ever having a balance issue. But if you go to church, you know, that's when the, one of the deacons has to walk you to your chair or something. We create these kind of crutches sometimes we don't even wear it. So is there anything besides balance, posture, pain? I think fall is a big issue. What's that? I said fall is a big issue. I mean, okay. we always do a fall assessment and once you hit a certain age. And um, I mean, just putting your underwear on. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we slowly start to, you know, instead of doing this real quick, we start to sit down and do it. And then we can't really bend over and do it. Yeah. So it, I think a lot of times with life, with these little issues, particularly balance, it's just it's such a slow progression that we don't really realize it until we have a fall. And, and I really, falls and balance were never really on my radar of excitement as a physical therapist. I'm, I was about back pain, neck pain, knee pain, whatever. But... Ten years ago or so, I started seeing a pattern of almost every knee, hip, back issue that I would see with a certain population, about 65 and up. I always, I want to know why. You know, when you come see me and you say, well, my hips start hurting me, I'm going to wear you out with, okay, before we get into, you know, I'm running from this, I don't know, when did this start? Because like, there's patterns to things. And I, I figured out sometimes the easiest solution is fixing the problem versus injections and all these, we, we treat symptoms. That, that's what our, what our medical world has become. We don't even talk about what happened. Like, it's like, I use the analogy a lot of times, like, okay, my gosh, you're, you're, what's your name? Ken Jones. Ken, your hand is burned again. Ken, let's get this injected, lidocaine, wrap you up. All right, come see me in two weeks. It's burned again. Like, maybe I need to stop saying, are you touching anything hot? Well, I mean, every morning I put my hand on the stove, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes it's like we're doing simple things that we, if we identify, we can really alleviate the main problem. And that's what pain is one of them. So falls is another thing. Falls is one of those that kind of falls under the radar, off, off the radar, because we ignore the fact that we're always kind of holding on to something. Or when you walk in the room, the first thing you do is go sit down because you feel more comfortable there. So, <clears throat> all right. Now these next few slides are kind of a joke because this is downloaded from some American medic or something. But I want you to kind of read it. Six percent of Americans will have a bell stop here in the lab. Let's see the next one. Um, I'm going to keep going with it. Oh, I must have edited it out. There's about, with the, with the, I was looking at different ones and, and one of the talks that they did from one of the American something <clears throat> that's, that's a, often downloaded that talks about 10 slides of how, you know, 60% of Americans fall and die with their hip, and it's like this, all this scary stuff, you know, of these horrible statistics that are, that, and then I thought, you know, as I was going through this, because I was looking at different resources, <clears throat> I thought, why would I want to include something like this in a balancing talk when, to me, one of the biggest reasons for falls is the fear of falling itself. We start to have no confidence in ourselves, you know. When you don't trust yourself, you kind of, and when you have all this negative info, be careful now. You could break your hip. If you fall and break your hip, you're going to be in the nursing home and die, okay? And then, yeah, we hear this all the time. Your back is so bad, based on this x-ray, if you were to fall, you'd be paralyzed. So when we hear this stuff, good Lord, why wouldn't we be scared? So we're kind of like walking around getting ready to fall. So I use the analogy like if you if you like me and I have a little fear of heights, if I'm on a hundred foot high sidewalk <clears throat> and I look over the edge, now a normal sidewalk I'm going to walk relaxed. But if I'm on a hundred, it's the same sidewalk, but I'm going to shuffle my feet a little bit. I'm going to walk real purposeful, and this is what happens when people start to have fear of falling. They start to shuffle their feet because they're trying to maintain contact with the surface. You know, they take the smaller steps. 
we walk very scared, and I see people do that all the time. And that's a hard thing to get out of unless you have somebody that really can direct you. So, oh, here we go. Yeah, one in five falls cause a serious injury, such as head trauma or fracture. So stay in your house and stay in your recliner. <laughs> Just kidding. One third of Americans fall. So anyway, there's a ton of stats here, but these are all kind of like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so self-assessment. Um, one of the things I teach people, especially as most people that come see me, pain is a motivator. My hip hurts, my back hurts, my knee hurts, whatever. But when I get them in, I like to get, I feel like a lot of times getting the pain under control is not, not that big of an issue once we identify some of the things that can change at home. And those simple things we can do to help them. Mobilization, movements we do. <clears throat> but towards the end of their therapy, I want to get them transitioning into an independent program, whether it's working out in a fitness center, or we got somebody who's trying to get in there. Thank you. Um, yeah. Or, but one of the things I think is helpful is developing kind of a daily self-assessment. And so, you know, I'll teach the patients how to kind of go through each every joint and just kind of check. Because if, if you notice, every day you wake up, you might have a little different ache or pain somewhere. Okay, and there's a reason for that because it's usually a position you're in, you rode somebody's car to Dallas, or you, you did some little different thing. And usually it's not a big deal. It, because you don't go away in a couple of days. But if you don't know that, it's hard to know what to protect and what not to protect. So there's a simple way sometimes to kind of go through that. And with patients, I'll talk about that. But also something to think about with your balance particularly is, do, do you guys kind of, any of you notice that you need to touch to hold on to things or people, particularly when you're standing for a long period of time? I used to see people in Fairfield, we got a big window that shows the parking lot. And I will see couples come in, particularly couples maybe in their 70s and 80s, and they're holding hands. And I used to think, wow, that is so neat. They have such a wonderful marriage and relationship that they love each other that much. After 50, 60 years of marriage, they still want to just hold on to each other. And I realized one day that has nothing to do with it. They, they actually can't stand each other. But they're, but they're, but they're yeah. trying not to talk. Is that so? Because you have, usually you'll have one person in that couple that maybe yeah. just doesn't have the confidence. Yeah. And you know, there, there could be some reasons that mm -hmm. can be helped, but most often there's things that you can do to improve that. So um, it just kind of highlights that we all kind of have some balance changes. Shuffling the feet. <clears throat> These are things subconsciously what happens too is you, the whether embarrassment that you can't stand for a period of time or that you're walking, you start to hurt, or we start to self-limit. So we quit going places, right? Instead of going shopping with the girls, you know, you, you begin to kind of, pop, some of us more consciously than others think about, man, that shit's going to be a lot of walking. I don't know that I can do it. You know, so we, we start to kind of pull away. And the more we do that, we create more I can'ts on our long list. And that's a bad place to go. So, like, I, I've had a talk one time I did, and it's on my hips or something, and the guy was saying, well, you know, I haven't been able to touch my foot. And, I haven't been able to put my shoes on in 10 years. And I, he was a coach I had in high school, in Fairville. And I, so I, I could mess with him. I said, at what point in your life when you can't touch your foot do you not say, I should probably do something about this, right? So when you identify that something is, we need to work on it, we, we do something. With balance, I find that a lot of people don't think there's anything to do about it. It's just, well, I'm getting older. It's just a part of it. It's not. There's a lot of things you can do. So we'll talk a little bit about what we can do. Um, so what does fear of falling, why does fear of falling matter? Um, you know, I talked a little bit about when we start to have some changes, we may become a little more apprehensive about going out. And when you walk on steps and stairs and inclines and declines, that's balance training all day long, right? So that the long as you do that, you're, you're comfortable with it. When we take our way up, when we take ourselves out of that environment long enough, we, we, we lose our confidence. And then if we don't do something to regain it, so like after his knee replacement, <clears throat> if he didn't say, you know what, I had some new knees, I had some good therapy, I feel good, and get back to living, he wouldn't be doing as well as he's doing now. I've seen people that had knee replacements and didn't have that kind of commitment, and they still have problems. And it's because they had a bad surgery, they had bad therapy or what. But it's probably because they just weren't committed. So it's easy sometimes to supplement, and that's something that can get you in trouble. <clears throat> so what is balance? Before we go to the next slide, uh, 
So what, tell me what balance is. What, is. what does balance mean to you? Walking straight. Walking straight. What do you think controls balance? Is there any particular balance organ you think, or what? Well, I, I have probably two or three things that's a problem. One is, you know, I'm 88 years old. Okay. And the other, uh, I don't have any hearing at all in my left ear. That okay. went when I was about 30 years old. So I think that contributes. But I honestly don't know why, you know, that the, my balance is gone. Uh, it's, uh, it was gradual. And uh, I don't know if it's getting, you know, worse or not. Yeah. But it keeps me from doing, I've always been very active. Okay. And it keeps me from doing the things that I want to do. Um, and medical doctors, you know, well, you know, it's not a, we don't know a whole lot about the balance problem. And then some of them say, well, we uh, haven't spent any money on the research that we should. And yeah. These kind of things. Which may help somebody in the future, but yeah. I would, if you could get me or whoever, or I could walk straight, yeah. there's one thing, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I am. We, we want uh, to. My wife and I uh, uh, like to dance. We have danced many, many miles. Yeah. And I can't dance now. Mm. So if I could get where I could dance again, I'd be happy. But let me ask her a question. Could he ever dance before? Oh, yeah. Okay. Can I, can I ask her some questions? Honestly? Yeah. When, when did his balance go bad? When he decided he couldn't do it anymore. Okay. Now, we had open heart surgery yeah. in 2016, and yeah. he says no. And don't get defensive now. Because <laughs> I, I know I got a wife, too, and when she starts talking about me about stuff, I'm like, no, wait a minute, that's not true. But there is, and I know he can still do it because there's one particular song that comes on. Uh -huh. And that's okay, and he'll dance yeah. with me. So it's... And that's interesting because our comfort, like, for example, let's just use this analogy. I'm, trust me, this I am not saying I got all this figured out, okay? I, I think it's super interesting. Balance to me fascinates me <clears throat> because no one knows the solution. And I think the reason is because our body is so complex. It's a lot more complicated than some little balance organ that we can do a test on. And some of your doctors... <clears throat> Doctors are very good about, they, they like um, empirical evidence, they call it. They want to test that says that's negative, that's positive. And balance doesn't fall in that range. It's, it's so many, it's multifactorial. It's muscles, it's tendons, it's weak. But it's also the mind and, and confidence. And well, I, you know, that's the problem. We, this song that she's talking about, you know, I'll risk it there. <laughs> but uh, the problem is, I'm afraid I'm going to fall and pull her down at yeah. the same time. So the yeah. fear if I dance less, the risk right. is reduced. But what if you say, what if I dance more, I get better at it? Because really, and I, I'm not saying that's the answer, I'm just a hypothetical question. Because when we start, start self-protecting and limiting, we create more protection, and then we become less you know, uh, comfortable doing those things. And I think it's interesting that you hear that song because that song probably evokes some memories or whatever and it, you, you feel more comfortable. It's the, it's the equivalent of somebody in their house, in their environment. Like I literally, I used to do home health for years and I would see it. I'd have a lady who was 90 years old and she'd get about a recliner and she'd be like, I used to see patients pretty late. I was probably about his age or younger so they always wanted to feed me and I was not there and then. And like, honey, you want anything to eat? And they would just be all over the house get this pot down here, and, you know, but then we'd go outside during the treatment, you know, after they fed me and we watched Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> but um, I used to enjoy a whole bell, but, so, but after we would do some work and I'd get them outside and I could just body tensed up, well, no, I don't like to go, I haven't been down in the back porch in a while, okay, well, let's go, and I didn't know at the time why, it just changed because they weren't comfortable, they weren't confident. It was, or they had a bad fall. You know, I had a patient not too long ago. <clears throat> she was actually somebody else was seeing her. I just happened to see her one day, and I said, you know, she was there for the back. How's your back doing? Oh my gosh, my back is so much better. And they were getting ready to transition to fitness center. And I said, well, you know, is there anything that's going on? I mean, she's like, other than my balance, I just, I'm doing great. I said, well, whoa, what about, talk to me about your balance. Well, when I had that fall two years ago, she had this really bad fall, she was standing on it. Somebody's bed and trying to put some banister. She 
rock and she fell. Prior to that, she'd been really very active, and she's probably 75, 80-ish. And um, so she had a really traumatic recovery, had some head trauma. And so, and she walked kind of like this, because I call walking scared. Not always, there's other reasons for it, but it's being very purposeful, like, and usually they're looking down or holding on to something. And so I have, we, we have a balance program, maybe I'll get to talking about it a little bit after I tell these stories, but it's very structured and specific and it works on doing simple things really re repetitiously enough and building it up slowly enough to where you have confidence throughout because what I saw with balance training, the way we were doing it, is we would have, let's say Ken came in there like, okay Ken, we're gonna work on your balance. Get on this foam and stand on one foot and close your eyes, you know? And it's like, that's that's balance training, but that's crazy. That'd be like me telling you, hey, let's go, we're gonna get you started, let's go bench press 300 pounds. You have to start at a place where somebody's comfortable, get them, find out what they, if dancing's a problem, let's don't dance. Work on weight shifting. Work on simple stuff. Get comfortable there. Then, I, then weight shifting with eyes closed. Then weight shifting on foam. But the thing is, like this particular lady, as we progressed on, and I pushed her into some of the uncomfortable stuff, because balance training is like getting stronger. It's working in an uncomfortable place. If you always protect yourself, you won't ever get better. Think about a cat. I, I, sorry, I'm going to give a million analogies. Are you guys still with me? Is this interesting at <laughs> all? <clears throat> if you break your arm, anybody broke their arm here? You ever been in a cast? Six weeks later, take the cast off. What happens? Can you straighten your arm? I mean, but the doctor says, hey, you're great. That ball on the x ray looks good. We're fixed. Good luck. See you later. Hopefully, he says, hey, it's going to be a little stiff and sore and I can get it moving, right? So when you get out of the cast, you expect, I've got to get this thing moving, and you find too, but it's a little tough sometimes. But you know that's okay, that's good pain, right? Mm -hmm. So we push through it. If you push through that, eventually that elbow or whatever you broke, that whole area becomes pretty normal, and we gain normal function. <clears throat> With balance, it's kind of interesting how a lot of it's because we don't have good direction, and it gets confusing. And like you said, you've been to all the doctors, and when I would send somebody back in the day for balance testing, is there water or anything? Yeah. Um, I would find with, I'll tell you what, let's do this. I'm going to go on the next slide because I want to talk about what technically balance is. And then we'll talk about some of the things that you can rule out to make sure that your balance health doesn't have some underlying bad issue. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat> so what is balance? So eyes, ears, and feet. And she had it all ago. She was kind of but technically, if you were to ask what balance is, balance is really three systems. So balance is our sensory. I'm taking stuff in. When I'm walking right now, my eyes tell me there's a flat surface. I'm getting information. My ears, I have a little small organ in here called vestibular organ. It's got these canals that have fluid. And every time I'm moving different planes, it gives me equilibrium, okay? And then you have your feet, which have these is nerves, they go to your feet, they give you sensation, it's hot, it's cold, it's soft, your muscles and tendons, where's my thing here? So, our eyes, that says okay. So your eyes, they give you the visual of what's going on, right? And then your ear, inside your ear you have a little kind of dime sized organ called the vestibular organ. And it's like these little canals that have little hair like structures in them that the fluid flushes through, okay? And that gives you that sense that when I close my eyes, I know my head's turned this way and it's turned this way. And then you have your feet. So your feet have muscles attached to them, like your calf muscle goes to a tendon, and that has receptors that tell you how long and if I'm on an incline, a decline, and without getting too much detail, you have a lot of information coming in, okay? So somebody might have diabetic neuropathy, right? Or they have hearing. Hearing is a big impact on balance as well. So hearing loss, some, if you went to your ENT doctor and they did some different tests, they find maybe you have a 
vestibular dysfunction. There's all, it usually the more complicated the name gets, the less we know about it, right? The longer or the more words it is. But there's a eyesight gets a little bit more challenging, especially at night. So we become so the point is is it is normal to have some balance changes, but when we take ourselves out of challenging those systems, we don't help ourselves much. Okay? So the big thing is, I, I tell people this all the time. Maybe first thing, first simple step is to get your eyes checked, get the right corrected lens, get a hearing aid, get your ears checked out. If you have um, diabetic neuropathy, get that figured out. But at the end of the day, we're, we're all going to have some things that are still not working 100%. And so that doesn't mean you have to have bad balance. It means you may have to work harder at it to get it better. Because what's cool about these organs, okay, your eyes, ears, your feet, is somebody who is um, a diabetic or maybe has numb feet, right? If that person, that person can still have good balance because if they continue to work and stay active, and they're forced to do stuff, their knees and hips become much more sensitive and receptive. And I've had people argue with me and I say, okay, that's cool. I understand, because if you have somebody who's a diabetic neuropathy and I don't have it, I can't really argue with the fact that they can't get better. But I will say this, what, how can you tell me somebody who doesn't have feet, right? <clears throat> Amputate, amputees. I know a lot of amputees that are all over the place, picking up stuff, running, sprints, so how do they have good balance? Because they don't have feet, right? So sometimes what happens is you work stuff, it gets better. And just because we can't explain it, doesn't mean that it's not happening. But we don't know until we challenge it, right? So there's a lot of the very good balance training. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, if you have a balance issue, or you know that you're not walking as well, and you want to do something about it, there's some really good ways to go about first identifying what the problem could be and then how to, how to get it better. So with us, what with physical therapy is, I will evaluate, I don't have anybody who wants to, I've got a, an example of one of our machines, it's a, we call it a balance machine, but that probably doesn't, it actually just check, it makes, it helps you see what you're doing and it can test to see how steady you can be. Um, but it will help identify sometimes how if you have good standing balance or not. And I know I'm probably getting too technical here, but um, is everybody with me so far? Does that make sense? So the eyes are in the feet, right? These are supposed to be in here. That's, that's a horrible foot. I think they lost their toe maybe. Um, right there. So the cool thing is, is we, we do certain movements, not even really exercises, I want to call them, but that challenge these systems. Because most of us that start to have some, some deficits in these areas become more visual. You use your eyes more. How many of you are careful about going out at night? Anybody? You guys are all like it's midnight and kind of, I don't know if Sandra was the curfew, they shut down. Um, my my mother-in-law my mother is very cautious about going out at night because she doesn't like to drive at night. I, I can't really, I mean, I'm getting, I'm almost 50. I, I have a hard time. I have to have a little flashlight. Whenever I'm working in my shop, I, I feel like I, I, I tell my son, my old man flashlight, I have to have some so I can see what I'm doing. So, I mean, it gets harder to see some stuff, but, and let's say that you hear a noise out in the yard or something like that, I mean, and you don't have a flashlight, or you're walking through your house, we tend to shuffle our feet a little bit because we're like, ooh, and that's when we catch our, ourselves in the fall. So, challenging those systems, is, a, is a, there's a very specific way to do that. Um, all right, let's move on a little bit. So, having annual exams, making sure your glasses are good. <clears throat> all right, where are we going? So, another thing about falls is like, what can we change? So, we can change our physical activity. I, I'm a big believer in the people who have the best balance are usually the most active people. They don't have to have somebody tell them what to do because they're always challenging their system. You know, if you're walking out in the yard and I have somebody who has a balance issue as we train and we get them a little more confident, I make them, once I feel comfortable they can do it, do the things that they don't feel like they can do. So if you were my balance patient, at some point, once we felt like we are getting better, I would say, your exercise today is dance with your wife every night and do that favorite song. And then once you do it good, you gotta do it two times now, and then we might do it three times. But a lot of times when it's just getting comfortable, 
and getting the confidence back and then maybe getting your muscle endurance back because balance can also be muscle, weakness, strength. So if we're sitting at home all day long, we're not only tight when we stand up, we're fighting that. We're, we're weak, our endurance is limited. So we've got a bunch of things against us. So these are the things we can fix. Physical inactivity, get to doing things you feel comfortable now and get more active. Your home environment, you know, take out. Most people, we don't have as many balls as we could because most people are pretty good about it. They know their house. Most of us have been living in the house so long you don't have to lie down and just turn here and turn there and there's a bathroom, right? <laughs> um, I don't know what make any bathroom comments, but, um, So we feel more comfortable, whereas if we were somewhere that we weren't that comfortable with, the lights are off, you know, we'd be all over trying to figure out, you know, where, where we are. Meditation use, it, it amazes me sometimes, it's particularly with balance, it's crazy. I just think sometimes we don't use our brain in healthcare. But the medications we are most often get to help with balance, actually one of the side effects is dizziness. You know, like, um, like I'm going blank here for some reason. I probably shouldn't say it since I'm up on my YouTube. I might have some dot med ENTs that are there, it's not true. <laughs> but the, uh, a lot of times medication when people have like a disequilibrium or they feel kind of dizzy or whatever, um, they'll give them a certain omeclizine is an anti, kind of anti-motion med. It's like the most common problem prescribed. And actually the ENT society says, and look at the camera, suggests not prescribing that, yet it is so over-prescribed. Meclizine is like ear Xanax. And basically it calms down that weird feeling that people may have. But the side effects of dizziness and lethargic. And so it, it, we treat sometimes dizziness and balance issues with medication that makes us less inclined to do stuff. Okay? Um, social isolation, weakness, and then improper pain, you know. One of the things and misconceptions I had years ago is don't ever get on a cane or walk because you'll never get off. I'm a big believer in if you can walk normal, walk normal. If you have a, one, a little something like this going on, you probably need a cane and let's fix that little hitch and get it better. Because too many people have this misconception that, you know, I'm never going to use my walkers are for old people. And they walk 10 feet and they go sit down because they can't walk any further. Right? I'd rather you walk half a mile with a walker, and eventually what I tell people is you walk long well enough with a walker that keeps you upright. I really like the up walkers. You guys seen those? We have we have at the clinic. We usually have people try them out. And I tell people sometimes, especially guys who want to use walkers, one thing I'll do is if I see a guy come in, he's like, I don't know why my back hurts and my knees hurt. It doesn't make any sense to me. And so I say, okay, well, I'm not going to try to tell you because I'm not even going to argue with me. So let's go. I'm going to video your walking. So I have to have a neat after we'll video the walking. I'll show them some motion. And I'm like, explain how if anybody, if I had James right now, stand right here, just like this, in about four or five minutes, I guarantee you he's going to hurt right here because I'm center gravity's forward. That's why we, we're, our hip flexors get tight because we do this all day long. And then we wonder when we get it, like, oh. you know, we can't stand up. So sometimes it's as simple as us getting up more and stretching these muscles. Because once we do this, now our center of gravity is forward, back hurts, knees hurt right here in the front. So simple little things again can make big changes. All right. We'll keep going. Medication, we talked about that. Blood pressure um, can be a big issue, especially getting up quickly. How many of you experience that? You get up real fast, you get that little, you know, do, do you guys know what that is? It's just the orthostatic hypotension is a fancy word for it, but it's just sometimes if you're taking certain medications, it's basically saying your when you hop up real quick, your circulatory system's not responding quick enough to keep that blood pressure pretty constant. So you get a little dip, and then it comes back. But the key is just being aware of it and don't just hop up, but stand there for a second. Get your bearings straight, as they say, and then roll with it, right? So, but it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong with you, okay? Um, how are we doing on time? I'm going to give you a break just a little bit, everybody. Everybody good? Okay. Um, so, can balance be improved? What do you guys think? Yes. Ken, what do you think? 
Ken's, Ken's on the fence right now. He's not quite sure. Okay. I, 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 want, I want you as a now. We're going we're gonna to video your progress, okay? So I want to see you. We're gonna, I want to prove to you it can change, okay? Because she wants to dance again. <laughs> Is four balance just a part of getting older? Because Ken's 88 years old now, you know. He's, he's pretty old. I don't know if you guys can. Yeah, I am. I'm in there. I, but, but 88, I've seen, you know, there's some 80, uh, most people don't have the best balance in 88, but how many of them do you think really work with their balance? So that's, that's the question. I don't know. I could be wrong. But we don't really know until we, we test that theory. Because I've seen 80, I got 88 year old guys, you know, some in the gym. Everybody kind of trains differently, but. I got one guy who's probably 85, and he's got just about every machine maxed out. Oh. He's strong. Now his form is not great, and his, his, he does things too fast, but he's strong. So I mean, you can't argue with that. So what about, um, any other questions on balance? Did you guys understand? Really be treated. Huh? Can it be treated? Yeah, how can it be treated? So I think that goes back to, it's just like, um, I think balance is one of the, so balance is like pain. Balance is a bit, it's a word that encompasses so many things. So when I say, when you, if you were to come and say, I have pain, I'm going to ask you where, right? Because I need no more information. But with balance, it's, we don't always ask those, the right questions. Like, I have bad balance. I'm going to say, okay. Well, let's check all the potential balance, the potential structures that could affect your balance and see which ones we need to work on. Because if you think of balance as like a cake, this is my new analogy. I, I always come up with new analogies. So if balance is a cake, we're going to need to write something more.
And then not one doctor can tell you the answer, because I can't tell you, can I can fix your balance. I can't tell you that without with confidence, because first I'd have to say, okay, let's do some tests, and I need to get some information on you. Do you have dizziness? Do you have so there's vertigo can cause some issues. There's a lot of little things that we have to kind of rule out. Do you have something that's like, have you had a stroke? Have you, you know, so you have to find out are there big balance issues that is the reason. And I, there's a test I'll show you in a little bit that really helps identify, not narrow down that you have this particular problem, but it says, hey, we've got a central origin issue in the brain that's affecting your balance that's going to require smarter people than me to help you. Okay? But if that's not the case, then we're just dealing with a bunch of this stuff. But this comp combines to create a pretty big obstacle, right? Are you with me? Anything else besides? So I think about this is our cake. And if we're trying to build, make a balanced cake, we need, this is a recipe. And sometimes we don't have the right ingredients for all this stuff because we, we don't have good strength. And what's interesting about it, it's kind of like they all feed each other, right? So let's say, what is your name? Irene. Irene. Irene, she got COVID last year, you know, whatever. She, she was sick for a couple of weeks. She's been, everybody's been isolated. She's, she's quit doing her little gardening and walking and all the things that kept her busy. She quit going to that in the library every day and taking the 15 steps up and down. All those are exercises and she quit doing them because she had to stay home. So she got a little weaker. Her range of motion got more stiff because she found out, you know what, I really like watching my gun smoke and the Virginia and all these <laughs> questions. And she sits there all day and the next thing you know, she's sitting on her honey all day reading little Harley Quinn up Broadway novels. <laughs> But you, you, we can create some bad habits. Do you agree? It's easy to get lazy. And when we're sitting like this all day, and oh, I gotta use the bathroom. Oh, I'm use the bathroom, go to the back, and we sit down again. And then, oh, you know what? It's six o'clock at night, you're evening, I'm gonna go to bed. And then you sleep like this. We stay in this position all day long, right? So if you flip that up here, now, your body even feels good here, but we're stiff here. That's the range of motion that somebody said that gets tight. Then that affects posture, and then that affects balance because it now throws your center of gravity up. But all these things kind of have an effect on each other. One can lead to, the, to another. But to your point, we've got to make sure, are you blind? No. Mm -hmm. You know, are you completely deaf? If you are, there's things that you can do. There's deaf people that have great balance, but changes in hearing have a huge impact. I like to work in my shop, believe it or not, I probably don't look like it, but I like to weld and do things, so I'm having to wear ear protection when I do that. And it's interesting how I'm always kind of like learning how to explain things to people. But with my hearing protection, I notice if I'm burning in something, and I forget I had it on there, and I kind of get focused, I'll just kind of, I've been all this stuff all the time. And I thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to wonder, I, you know, I'm like, what is that, you know? But what's interesting about it hearing is we feel reverberations off walls, and I don't know exactly all the answers on that, but you definitely, when you still hear something as well, it affects your response and that sensory feedback. So, but I guarantee you, if I put those earmuffs on and I start spending more time in my shop with that, Eventually, this is what would happen. I would adapt to it. I would become more aware. My visual input would start to improve. Just like somebody who's uh, amputee, they become their knee receptors and all that start to kick in. You put, you have to have what we call graded exposure. So graded exposure is you put yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable consistently enough, and then you keep ramping it up a little bit slowly. Next thing you know, you're doing things you never would have believed you did. So the answer is, I can't, I don't know if I can help you with your balance, but we really don't know until we try. I guarantee you we're not gonna make it worse. Um, and that's the best, you know, to me that's the best answer. Is like, we can at least maintain what you have, but let's see if we can get it better. Does that make sense? Now, anybody else have any ideas on what can affect balance? Obstacles. Obstacles, yeah, so yeah, you're home. 
Your environment, right? Your dog, dog your cat. The dog, oh my yeah. gosh, yes, that's a great point. Your brothers, your brothers, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Because obstacles challenge all these things even more. And what's interesting with balance and kind of what got me thinking in the beginning, because the first few years, um, I would say, I, does Irene, right? I say, okay, Irene, what happened to your knee? Oh, it's been hurting how long? Three months. Okay, what happened three months ago? I don't know. Okay, well, Irene, we're not going to continue on until you tell me. Let's at least think about it, because I want to help Irene figure out what happened three months ago. So that was January. What did you do in January? And I've gotten better at explaining to people why I ask all these questions, because I want to have them identify, like, what did I do that might have led to this? Because if we don't have any awareness that there's a cause and effect, then we just think we can walk around and all of a knee hurts, right? That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> anyway, that's why I ask why. I'm always like, so what, what I find out is I already say, well, you know what, I don't know what happened. But three months ago, oh, you know what, it's when I got that puppy. And the puppy got in front of me, and I think I had a little fall. Oh, well, you didn't tell me about that, rain, and you didn't put it in your paperwork either, so what's going on with the fall? Oh, well, I just didn't think about it. People underreport falls like crazy because they don't think about it. It's embarrassing. We don't talk about falls because that means I'm getting a little older. I don't, we don't talk about that. It stays at home, right? So that's something that I found over and over was underreported. So I'm like, okay, well, let's get this knee better and do some things here, but let's work on this balance. Because what happens is that little puppy incident now, whether that was truly the puppy or you just, there's not a day that goes by that you don't just kind of step, you know, we, we all bump into stuff every day. But, and we don't even think, it doesn't even go on our radar. But then there's the time you fall or something happens, and now every single one of those incidents become scary. So what do we do? We take ourselves, we add try, I can't walk over extension cords anymore, and I can't go up to that, the conference hall anymore. And so we start to kind of self-limit to protect, okay? I don't know how I got on that. Obstacles. <laughs> so that's the thing about, and that's a good point. So we, we remove the obstacles. Yes, ma'am? Talk about how those of us who have diseases manage your balance, like arthritis. Yes. How arthritic means pain. Yes. So pain, that's a great one. Because pain, if we have a painful knee, we protect it, okay? And we also are very aware of that pain too, okay? So we start to really be conscious about it. And pain often can lead to the progression. So let's say you you decide that I'm going to do a new workout program, I'm going to start walking more, and that knee gets a little bit sore, and it kind of keeps getting worse, and now it's painful. And now just how you walk, which affects your posture, you quit working out as much, so your strength gets bad, your range of motion, your, your knee gets stiff, so now we have poor range of motion. We're hurting, we don't trust that knee can hurt any minutes, so I've got to be very careful, so now our confidence is affected. You see how that all kind of intertwines? So the, the goal for me is find out, you probably got something, every one of us isn't perfect in any of these areas, but what's the most important area? What is the primary focus first? Is it pain? Because if it's pain, if I have somebody that has poor balance and they have pain, pain is a priority. Let's get that fixed. If I have somebody that has poor balance and they have a range of motion deficits, let's get that fixed first. You have to find out what is the what's the number one thing that's affecting your balance. Because remember, balance is this big umbrella of all kinds of stuff. If balance, if it's because we've got some hearing issues or ear dysfunction, and this is where it gets confusing because if you go to your medical doctor, and I'm not knocking that at all, but this is how they think about it. When you say, I have bad balance, you're probably going to get, well, you know, Ken, you're already eight years old, so, you know, it kind of comes. I don't like that answer. I think, I don't care if I'm 108, I can always get better. But, I would, but a lot of times what they'll do is say, well, what's happening? Are you having ringing, tingling, you know, numbing, you know, this kind of stuff? So they may send you to an ENT and they're going to check the inner ear and see if there's any dysfunctions and things like that. And there might be. And if that's the case, you might get some treatment, ear drops, maybe you have a vestibular neuritis, there's some fancy little things that can happen when we get inflammation that can be temporary. Most of the things that we have when we get 70 and up are some slow degenerative issues, which are pretty normal, that I bet 70% of the people in this room have, but you don't even know because you never had it tested. But when you start testing stuff, guess what? You start getting more diagnosis. 
Now, is that why you're having balance issues? Or is it because your knee hurt and you started kind of limiting yourself and then a year of sitting on your hiney all, you know, watching the Virginian, and now we are falling. So that's what happens is there's so many factors involved and you have a fall and then we try to make it one thing. Does that make sense? So I don't know the answer to all this stuff, but I do know how to, we can change it a lot. Yes, ma'am. I've noticed that if I step wrong and I'll be in pain, like my, and I've gone to the chiropractor to get it realigned. Yeah. Yeah. And it works, but then I feel like I'm having that inflammation again. Like yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a quick fix, but then it turns that leak back to the same place I started. And that's where I think techniques, whether it's chiropractic, physical therapists, we manipulate, we do drum as well, and those are very useful tools. But you have to follow up with something to evoke movement, strengthen confidence. Because if I have this bad knee, and I can say, okay, what I want you to do is, is just hold off on your exercise a little bit, do this, this, and this, and she's like, oh my gosh, it feels so much better. You're not fixed now. Now you can actually start getting better. So that's what happens when you flare up. We do a little tricky stuff, feels good. Now we can start actually getting you better. And that goes into like move. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Probably give you guys a break here in a second. But that's where we have to recover movement and strength. Because we get pain to calm down, so now we're not protecting as much. But if she goes right back to her normal work day, guess what? It's susceptible. It's going to flare up again. So that's where we guide you to say, okay, your pain is better. All right, here's the right dosage of stuff that you can do at home or your normal day. And I want you to use this cane for a week or do this dinner or try not to garden this week. I'm always pushing movement, but sometimes we have to turn the volume down a little bit. So you can have another week of, okay, now it really feels good. And then you get confidence back. And then you slowly get back in your normal routine. But otherwise, you get stuck. You know, whatever it is, it hurts. I go get this little tricky treatment. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I used to tell people, if the bigger ad in the paper it is, you run, right? I proved this laser surgery, you know, Star Wars. But some of that stuff is helpful, but for the most part, unless you have a traumatic event, you didn't have anything surgery worthy. You just had something you overworked or overstressed, or you're in a bad position, or something in the wrong position, or you were in somebody else's car. Or it's something that, and that's why I do these why things. So I don't know why. When did this start hurting? Because I found so many times it's the simplest thing. You know what? Anyway, I'll tell you an interesting story when we get to the pain section in a little bit. Um, any questions on this? All right, you guys want to take a little break so you can hear me talk for a little bit? Is this helpful? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I hope it is. I mean, you guys are doing a good job. I feel like you're interested. <laughs> so how about we just move around and stretch? So I'm going to demonstrate. Everybody stand up for me just a second.
accept. Who in here can I pick on? Can I pick on you? Sure. <laughs> so slide your chair back a little bit. And uh, I want you to, can you stand up without using your hands? Go ahead. Just go ahead and have a seat. Just sit first. Do you think you can stand up without using your hands? Okay. Now, I'm not going to make you ask this, but think in your mind right now, or just if you feel comfortable, how many of you can stand up without using your hands? Okay. Now, I don't want you to necessarily test it. That was pretty good. But that's, it's crazy how something that simple, when I ask a patient to do that, how many people automatically get fearful? Like, oh, crap. Hmm. I don't know if I can do that. That's kind of scary. Hmm. That is, to me, one of the best exercises you can do, period. Is stand up, get to where you're com comfortable standing without using your hands, and do it every day. Because we get in the habit of developing this little process of going. So you can still groan and moan, that's fine. But, so stand up and without using your hands. Don't to get on the floor again. Oh, that's hard, baby. Back to the down there. Yeah. So one of the cold tests. We do these functional tests that actually is a ton of research on. There's a five um, time sit to stand, 30 seconds sit to stand, six minute walk test. <clears throat> so I'll do, I'll do wellness checks for patients. Um, sometimes some of you guys may have got a call before. And like at the beginning of the year, I, I started doing this. We go call um, existing patients and say, hey, you want to come in for a wellness check? And so we'll do some functional tests and it helps. It's cool because you do a, a very simple test and then there's normative values based on research to say, hey, if you're 78 years old, you should be able to do this and this, okay? So I'm going to have you stand um, in 30 seconds, okay? As fast up and down as you can, 30 seconds. You know what, let's, let's do this one. Go ahead and sit back. I'm going to have you do five times at the stand. That's kind of a tough one. Let's just do, I'm going to have you up and down five times. And I'm going to, can you time it, James? <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of, I, I know nothing's going to happen. I'm not 88, but I am 88. 80, okay. All right. Um, you're not ancient, you're just... I'm getting right. there. Okay. I'm glad. All right, we're doing whatever you are. Okay, ready? Five, so five times up and down on hands. Go. One. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Two. Okay. Four, five, <laughs> and then sit down and stop it. How many? How long? Uh, Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. Okay. Uh, so I think for eighty, eleven seconds. Uh, I, I don't believe. I mean, sometimes I question this because I feel like I would say for just visually looking and seeing how you move, you're probably on the upper. You're, you know, I, I would say you're above average because I can tell you you're stay active and you're, you've done a lot of good stuff. So that's a good round of that. <laughs> that's a lot of work, by the way. So I want to say about 15 seconds is about the time that's, that's normal for that age group. But I would expect it almost to be, I, I would really say that most of the 80 year olds I see can't do that. And five, that's just sitting and standing five times with eight hands. And that doesn't sound like much until you try it. Yeah. <laughs> but imagine if she did this every day. You would get so good at that, you would pop up and down. And then your strength gets better, and you become more reactive, and you get more confident, and you feel better. And then if you bump into something, you just kind of react. Because that's another part of balance. It's like having the strength and the, the reaction to, to take over. So simple things like that can make a big difference. All right. We'll take a break for a second. Thank you for participating. Yeah. Um, and if we, if we have, I would like to have, I need to be back. What time is my first grab? One o'clock? Yeah, one o'clock. Yes, sir. Okay. I would like, I'm going to go through some of this. I would like to leave a little time for those interested to do the balance. There's a test that's pretty cool, um, and it checks a couple of things of your static standing that give us some inter in interesting information. But the cool thing I like about balance tests like that on a machine is that it's really a good objective measure that we can compare to later. And, um, we did a, a study four or five years ago. I had a talk like this in Corsicana. And I have a, a group of seniors that do senior fit class there. And they've been doing it for five or six years. And so I had, most of them were all these senior fit gals and guys. So I had about 
30 people, and I would say at least 60, 70 percent of them were did, did that class. I'm, I don't, I, they did, there's not like an organized balance program or whatever, they just did exercise. And of the people that did the senior fit class, they exceeded the normative values, like blew it out of the chart as far as their balance. And the ones that didn't do any kind of exercise were the ones that either did normal or way below. So I don't know the reason for that. I, I think I do, but I mean, it's, it's a small study, but it's really interesting how just being active, to me, just getting in your car to go to the gym is already way ahead of some people. And I don't care what your age is. I actually, we have a rule of my gym both places. If you're 90 or up, you're free. Lifetime, you have a lifetime membership. I mean, that years ago, because I had about four or five 90 year olds. And I, I don't remember what, what this was, I don't know how long ago. But I, one of them was up paying their monthly membership, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Why am I charging this person who's nine years old just, just making the effort to come work out? So I, I made a rule that free to all 90 ups, which is, you know, I've had, I would get some of that 20 year membership, so they're 110, no, I'm just kidding. I've got something to look forward to. Don't, yeah, don't, don't break me, Ken. Yeah, Ken's got it like, to be 150, and I'll be like, or let's see everything. Yeah. Ignore that. So, um, posture is usually the most boring thing in the world for most people to even think about. I didn't realize that because I got really excited when I started realizing how I can improve posture and help people with balance and all kinds of things. Until I did a talk at one church I'm at where I live and I had about 30 or 40 people and I could just tell about halfway into this posture talk that it was kind of that, <laughs> like they were literally in church, you know, so, um, because most of us don't even think about posture, um, but when I see people, for example, my dad, poor guy, he's 75, I wear him out. Anytime I see him just doing a little bit of this, I, I don't care where he is, I'm going to yell at him. And he's going to have to stand up straight. Because I, posture is such a habitual thing. You know, most of us, when you stand up, you really have the ability to stand up tall. We just have decided that this is a lot more comfortable. So what happens is, you go ahead and sit it is when we sit more than we stand, our body, you grow to what you, you become your recliner. You know, if you if you spend a time recliner, you would, I can tell you what brand recliner you have based on how you're standing almost. So because you become so bent over. Is that one recliner do I say? So my I advise somebody I say this, so what do you spend most of your time? Well I want to spend most of my recliner. This is usually on like the first visit, I'll say, okay, so what I want you to do is when you get home you're gonna take your recliner outside and burn it for me. <laughs> You know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but be, recliners aren't the problem. Posture is usually not, it's, there's not like a good or bad posture, which is something new I've started saying. And we've always been taught, you know, have this perfect posture. Really, any posture you're in too long is a bad posture. You know, even sitting up nice and tall with a little lumbar roll, if you spend three hours there, you're going to probably hurt somewhere, right? If we slump too long for three hours, you're going to hurt somewhere. So there's not really a, a bad posture as much as it's just being in a position too long, okay? And you could argue that some people, and I don't care you know, what the opinion is on that, I just I think that's the simplest way to think about it. I definitely think there's better postures. So, go ahead. One thing with, with um, and this isn't necessarily posture, but I'm just gonna ask you some questions. Low energy, joint pain, difficulty walking, restricted breathing, soft shoulders, Depression, poor balance, we're falling. Okay. Anybody, you know, has that answer there. I would say most people probably have experienced one of those symptoms, right? And what's interesting about the sitting posture, if we do it long enough, it can affect all of those. And it's interesting, like people, most people's jobs are sitting. And I think there's a study that shows if you have a job, um, if you have, if you work at a job, like an office job, for 20 five years, doing a normal eight hour shift, over time, that's equivalent of sitting for five years, okay? And then what's interesting is, we most of us sleep on our side, okay? How many of you sleep on your side? Because we sit, we sleep in a sitting posture, if you think about it. We, we spend our day like this, and then we sleep like this. So we don't hardly ever really do this. 
And if we had like a GPS system that tracked your moving movement, it would be really interesting to see how much total time you spend actually setting up. So to me, it doesn't make, I mean, it's common sense, like why would your back not hurt? Because if we're here so much, this gets tight, it pulls you forward. When I'm standing up, I'm having to kind of fight this, you know, on a very low level. So you're, you start to get back tension after maybe five or so minutes or 10 minutes, depending on how much you sit or stand. So there's some really simple, simple things you can do. But the other thing about sitting that I found that's interesting, just through years of seeing this stuff, and then when I research it, I find other people are seeing this too, is how much it affects your breathing, okay? And I watched my dad. I, I try to have breath for the young son a lot. And I know he'll just sit there and drink his coffee, and every now and then he'll go. Anybody ever do that, like that catch-up breath? I realized, watching him, and I could be wrong, I, I realized he's sitting in such a slump position that his diaphragm is already kind of being compressed, his rib cage is compressed. So ha, everybody kind of slumped like this for me. Like, how, how could you even breathe properly like that? So then that creates all kinds of issues, you know, in itself. And so sitting in a better positioning, up taller, automatically opens you up and lets you breathe better. But a lot of us have been in such a bad habit of breathing for so long, we shallow breathe as it is. Like for, my dad's been to a million people about his breathing and for over the years. And everybody says, well, you have asthma. And then the next hour says, you don't have asthma. And he takes medication. And it's just, but every now and then he gets a shortness of breath episode. And so I've been, I've been just, he's my experiment a lot of times. <laughs> and so uh, over the last year, I've had him doing some breathing exercises because we're not trained in physical therapy school to think like this per se. Like your daughter was probably, and I wasn't really, to focus so much on breathing. It's a lot of exercise, and it's, it's good stuff, but sometimes it's the simple things that can really impact us a lot. So just getting in the habit of taking some time to actually take a deep breath, you know, on a daily basis, or sit on your phone to remind her, it's kind of amazing how much better that can help. So I don't know how much that helps people, but I think that's a pretty interesting thing. But I know that when we get in this position of sitting here all day, we're going to have some indigestion issues. Um, it, even your movement's going to be affected. It's, it's really fascinating to me on breathing. So sitting in the epidemic, we talked about most people sit on average about 12 hours a day. Um, you can go to the next one. That's more scary stats. So here's a neat little idea. I have a posture app that's kind of cool. So this lady, actually, I wish we had done the one without having the latest. Amazing progress. So what it does, I take a picture. Now, I used to, when I, I learned now that when I do these posture tests, I don't tell people, hey, we're going to do a posture test, because guess what happens? They're like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, she was doing that. So I'd like to say, hey, I want you to stand right here for me. Um, and just, you know, relax if you know me well, and I'll, I'll talk to them and make them, see, if you come see me now, I can't treat you like this. <laughs> I might have them, because I, I, I want to provoke symptoms. I mean, I'm a big believer if, if, you're, if you're hurting and you're not hurting now, it's, you know, how frustrating is that when the doctor said, well, it's just not bothering me today. I'm like, well, let's make it hurt. I want to, I hope I can help you find out what's wrong with this. Let's figure out what structure's involved. So if back pain's the issue, of course, if somebody's sitting, they're not hurting usually. So stand up. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, we'll just stand to it. And eventually they'll start to be like, you know, there, there it hurts. And that's when they kind of start kind of giving in a little bit here. And so I'll get the picture now, and then I'll let them sit down and recover. And then I'll get them back up and say, okay, now stand up as tall as you can. Because that tells me what their potential is. Okay, so James, you watch me on time. <laughs> what so, you, you guys still with me? Yeah. All right, so you got... Irene over here, and she's kind of gotten to where she stands a little bit like maybe this, whatever right here, okay? So she's gotten comfortable having her center of gravity just a little bit forward, all right? When your center of gravity is forward, it puts more stress right here on your back. Does that make sense to you guys? Have you ever picked up a gallon of milk out of the refrigerator? And it's kind of, it's pretty heavy, but you do out here what's really heavy. So the further we get your center of gravity, your low back's going to hurt. Now, I'm not saying this is the cause of everybody's low back pain. I'm just saying this can create my muscle fatigue. Now, if I have her say, okay, now, I want you to do this off posture after I find this is what's going on. I'm going to say, now, stand up as tall as I can. And she really pulls it in. And now she's kind of got the whole, you know, now she's standing a little bit better. Her 
temperature here. You know, not perfect, but so much better. I know that's what she could be like. But it's tough because maybe she sits a lot in these muscles here in the front, and the, all of this and all the have gotten tight to where it just it's work to stand up. Plus, it just it feels better to so kind of do this, right? So we get in, we get in, we get in, gravity pushes further. So if we really focus on, and I, I've actually even changed my posture program even more. I, I believe in finding the simplest, easiest approach to everything. Because the way I used to do it is like give you all these cool exercises, about 20 of them, I need side about change. But it's so hard to do that. I don't you know, we, we don't have that kind of discipline to change our behavior. So I would say, Irene, you're tight here, here, and here. I want you to get in this position. You just have to try to make it a position. I might say, just lay on your back. Go, go get in your bed three times a day, three minutes. Lay there, put your hands back here, and just open up and just relax, breathe, whatever. And then you get up and do your thing. Because we spend so much time here, and everything is all tight and bent over, right? So, all that to say, this lady did this for a while, and actually she, I got her, there's a brace that, you know, actually Medicare does cover it. I don't sell them, and I don't make anything off of it, but I found that they're really good about, they're good reminders. You guys have seen the posture stuff on, online and stuff. I've tried every single one of them. Anything that tries to correct you will not work. Our muscles are too big, our body's too big. You start to lean into it, it cuts out blood flow. But the cool thing about this one, once you go ahead and flip it for me, is that this actually is a little metal aluminum thing, and you can form it to your, if I'm here, I'll say stand up tall, and then we have a guy that comes in and he'll form it. And it's nothing really high tech, it's just a simple put that to where you're getting that kind of midway point. And then they wear their brace a couple hours a day, it's not all day. But when you lean forward, it pulls on you. It's a reminder to stand up tall. Because it, because you've established, our ran established when she stood up tall, she's got the ability to do it. She just got out of the habit. Now, if somebody has severe osteoporosis, they're going to have less improvement, but they can still make a big difference. So posture is not real complicated. It's just a matter of identifying what a, reminding yourself to, to practice good posture. Um, but standing up just in itself is not going to help you necessarily with your posture. Because if you're walking like this all day, you're just training bad habits. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Because I think posture is one of those things, and I'm always questioning myself, can you really improve posture? I have researched that so much. I came across a lady that, she's an old PT from 1970s or something. She's been doing some really cool, simple stuff. But we get so fancy with our healthcare now that there's all these little neat gadgets and stuff like that. And I try them all, they don't work. Because at the end of the day, it takes commitment. You know, you can't have a passive patient. I can't say I'm gonna help you with your posture, and the only time we work on posture is twice you know, a week when you come in for a 50 minute hour long session. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be, hey, here's what you're gonna do on your own, but you gotta make it simple enough that they're actually gonna do it. Because if I give you this complex, and better posture is not strengthening. That was a misconception I think we all have. It, strengthening is a part of it, but you've gotta get, if you're standing up nice and tall, you're actually using minimal muscle activity. My low back right now is almost completely inactivated because I'm balanced. When you go here, now immediately my muscles kick in. So the way I would train, a lot of people think is like, oh, you have a weak back. Let's get you stronger. <laughs> people that have back posture, they have some of the strongest backs because they spend all day like this. They take a 70, 80 pound torso and their muscles, and I've seen them. The ladies that have bodybuilding peristyles, they're tight as a brick because they're always engaged. Strengthening that is not going to yield any good results. Stretching this to where you can take the stress out of those make a big difference. And I've even had people that during that process I'll have them get a rollator or an up walk or something to make sure that they have some support because now they're walking more correctly, right? So if you can walk all day at Walmart, and then you put your card up and you can barely make it to the car. Well, that's a good sign of you need more practice walking with some assistance right now. Let's spend a lot of time and get really good at that. And then we can wait off the car. Okay? Pain. Okay, and I think I've covered this probably a lot. But, and you had a great question about those as far as like what it affects. As you, hopefully you've seen all these kind of tie together, right? Balance, posture. 
but how pain can affect it too. So pain is something I start talking a bit more about because I know what I do as a physical therapist, but a lot of times the misconception is we just strengthen people. So somebody in pain is going to go seek maybe pain management and get a bunch of, sh bunch of shots, which sometimes is necessary, versus saying, hey, why don't we figure out the activities that might be causing this and let's get it better. Like, I don't know about my here, but I can't help it. Lateral hip pain. Oh my gosh. I have seen so many people, they sit most of the day and they start to have pain down the side of the legs. And the reason is usually is because their chair is kind of pushing them in a little bit and it creates a little low stretch to their hips, which creates a pain. And I'm not saying everybody's this way, but a lot, most of the times this is the easiest thing. They get a little lateral pain and it starts to go down the leg. Well, you go to your doctor, anytime you know about leg pain, sciatica, of course. So, it could be, but what I'll have those people do before we just get crazy and worry about, let's just do some movements every now and then, you know? And I'll have the simplest little thing. Anytime it hurts, do this. If it makes it feel better, if it makes it feel worse, stop. And just sometimes that's simple, because what you're doing is it's the equivalent of me taking my finger here and I just take it like this. That doesn't hurt me. But if I did that for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, I'm starting to put some stress to some structures. My brain's gonna hurt a little bit. So pain is a good thing. Pain's telling me, hey, David, move. And so I'm gonna go. But after about a minute or two, I don't feel it anymore. So I know nothing's wrong with that. I just put too much stress here. Mm -hmm. but, if you, but if you go to your doctor or somebody, or somebody says, hey, I've got this pain when I sit, I know it hurts me, and I get up, and it does get better when I move, but what do you think that could be? Well, let's do some x-rays and imaging and MRIs mm -hmm. and injections and you have side of it. Well, could be, like for the YouTube audience, I'm not pretending to have this answer for everybody, but so many times it's a simple matter of just get those hips moving. And it goes away. And that's what patients sometimes just need to hear. Your pain is okay. If you sit with your leg crossed, that's not a bad posture, but you sit long enough, your, your hips gonna hurt a little bit and you can cross the other leg. So that's exactly what your pain is. It's a guide saying, hey, do something different, right? Um, if you have an acute injury, it's different, all right? If we sprain our ankle or whatever, that's when you hurt all the time, okay? So I want everybody to stand up a second for me. And I want you to do a little small neck bounce right here so your neck will relax a little bit. Does this hurt you? Yes. So just do a lot of tiny, tiny stuff right here. So your neck, can I pick on you a second? I can, I, she's been doing this kind of little thing here, so I know she's getting tight. So she needs to move. Her body's saying move right now. So but she's trying to be polite and not stand up and move around. But what you should do in the future is just stand up and just kind of move your neck a little bit. Get your shoulders, do some shrugs, get some blood flow. Because she's got a little posture thing and she's kind of got it tense and she's trying to pay attention here. And these muscles are getting a little overactivated, so they're kind of kicking in, and then you don't get good blood flow, so you get oxygen deprivation, and it starts to get achy stuff. So just moving can make a huge difference. And don't stretch it, so not, that's what we tend to do, is keep it small, just little stuff like that. Movement is, is such a, if we, if she were to say, let's say you sit, continue to sit longer, 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 and it gets builds up, builds up, now we have tension here, Pain can proliferate or refer, okay? When you start to get pain that gets bigger, that means it's starting to get worse. So let's just get things moving. All right, let's sit back down. Um, so if you, and you have an injury, uh, when, you, when you come to our clinic, I talk a lot about pain, movement, strength. That's my, I actually thought I didn't know, but I realized there's other people that call something different, so some people can figure this out too. But the three phases of recovery are pain, movement, strength. For most injuries, we have a pain phase, and it's saying, hey, Ken, you need some help, go do something about it, or Ken, back off a little bit on this. Sometimes we don't really know how to use that pain to our advantage, so we start to overprotect, and we quit doing stuff, whereas we should just back off a little bit and then maybe get back into it. The next phase, once pain gets better, so once that pain calms down, you have to restore your movement, okay? Which is, if you recover that elbow that was broken in a cast, and I get my elbow back, now I can start strengthening. So if you follow those guidelines, you recover that area, and you, you get back to normal a lot of times. But we don't have that information, and we're so 
talk to protect if it hurts and it's pain and people don't get this bad thing and you have some trophy jerk bursitis or your iliotibial tib 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 band's tied. A lot of times it's just get moving and it's going to calm down and get your motion back. But just because we stop hurting doesn't mean it's fixed or healed. That's the misconception sometimes. So that's why I'm not a big fan of pain management the way it's handled sometimes is because you start numbing stuff up. Well now we have to cut off the feedback system. We don't know is this a good movement or bad movement. So I'll have patients that go get their injections and then now you know what, I don't have any pain at all. I'm like what are you doing? Oh I can sit all day long now. Well guess what? When their injections wear off, you're going to be even more painful doing less than what you did before. So we got to figure out how to manage it better. I don't have the answers on all that, but I'm, I'm trying to learn to teach people to be a little more active in that. And also get feedback. What we got next? So, keep rolling, good. All right, cool. So I think the way that I try to help people think about pain is this respect it, but let's don't fear it. You know, and, and if it's, unless you had a traumatic injury, so if Ken wakes up and his back is killing him, like I'll tell patients, okay, think, did you fall off the ladder? Did you have a car accident yesterday? No. Can you think of what caused it? If you can't even think of what caused it, you probably didn't create any tissue trauma or big new, new damage. So that's why when you go get an MRI and you say, oh my God, I've got a herniated disc, I'm like, you had that three years ago, probably the same one. Because you didn't do anything new to create that. It's been there. So a lot of times I don't believe that's the pain producer. It's just you sat too long in your recliner yesterday or you did something simple. Now, that's not always the answer, but most of the time that's the case. So, any questions on that? All right, do, do you feel like, what do you think when you go to your doctor or somebody, I'm not knocking doctors by any means, okay? Because I, I think we all are kind of learning different ways to talk, to talk about it. And I've even kind of, I have changed the way I treat it so much, almost every year I kind of evolve a little bit. Hopefully I'm going in the right direction. But I've learned that to keep it simple can help so many more people. I have found, the less little tricky stuff I do on people and just teach them some changes and usually just listen and find out what are, what, and when I say what are you doing at home, I have to kind of rephrase that because I, I think that sometimes it makes people defensive like, wait, I'm not doing it, what do you mean it's not my fault? I don't mean that, I mean what activities are happening that are leading to this bad result? So let's figure out how to change that because I can create temporary change. I, I know I could do a little table up here, we have she could come up here and I can do some neck stuff and, I, and I, I'm pretty confident I can make her just feel, oh my God, that feels so much better. And that's not me being confident, cocky, maybe just a little bit, but there's just, it's easy to make stuff feel good. You move it, you feel the heat on it, I'm talk nice to her, she, she's, like, she's like here, and she'll feel a little better. But I want to create a long-term neck relief, so I'll still do that stuff a lot, but then I'm going to say, I need you to change this and this and this, and when you sit, make sure that you're you know, maybe using that long bar roll, these chairs are the worst, by the way, ever, and it's not your fault. It's just, it's amazing design. I, we had these senior, the senior fit, um, or silver sneakers, sent us a bunch of these chairs for our groups, and it's crazy. The angle, there's no support, and you're basically forced to sit like this. So, but if you're sitting on the bony part of your butt, not everybody, because some of you got so tired that'd be uncomfortable, but for the most part, it keeps us from going. Here and that 15 pound head now is getting all loaded up here versus just here. Okay, so just simple positioning because pain that comes on slowly is a stress issue. It's being in one position too long. We change the position, do some movements, it goes away real quickly. If we ignore it and do it every single day, it becomes now more chronic. Okay, and that's when things get complicated. Any questions before we do some mount stuff? Okay. All right. So who wants to go first? And before I have to do it, I'll explain a little bit what this is about. But who wants to do their mount? Does everybody want to do it? No, you do. <laughs> <laughs> we won't judge anybody, and all the results are being oh. yeah. So before you hop up, let me explain to you. All right. This one over here. And can you grab the chair here? So what this test is. Um, that I'm going to do is, uh, I don't know if you have a seat here. If you guys want to come around, you're welcome to. Or can you kind of share it around here? Yeah. Anyway. All right, why don't you have a seat up here for me? I'm sorry. Stand up here for me. Have a seat, that probably won't. 
track with 59, and then it went to 43. So just that one, he, for the le less lower number is better. So he improved by about 20%, 10%, 15%, because he got used to it. And see, that's what happens is our body, our brain, your cerebral cortex particularly, it's able to adapt and it kind of, it calibrates stuff, okay? So it was able to. Lower number was? Lower number is better, okay? Because it's less movement. It's tracking how many, how many centimeters of movement you have. So what I'm getting at is he improved actually because he started his brain like, okay, I see what we're doing here. So the more you practice on this, we will see that lower, that lower number get better. Then we work, start working on dynamic stuff, weight shifting, foam. All right, let me get you to, I thought you stepped here, we tried once, so you get those feet. Okay, back it up just a little bit here, there, and there, that's good. All right, so stand as straight as you, as relaxed as you can. Here we go. So you see a little dot. how much her center gravity and she's got some really good strategies she's figured out because you get those hands blocked back here now you now you really have kind of locked in good balance and then what happens is she's she's making she's staying upright but she's making these really small changes so that's what that demonstrates the you know and this is again this is the simplest balance test you can do there's actually a lot more involved ones that require eyes closed head movement that we would do normally um, but that shows you've got a great, so if I, if, let's say she was having some fall issues or whatever, I would say, hey, your baseline, your foundation of balance is incredible. Now let's get you better at moving. Because that's where, that's the people that can have, that have really good balance are, for whatever reason, now are fearful of falling and they become very protective. But we know she's got the recipe for balance, she's got the range of motion, she's got the strength to stand, um, she's doing pretty good, she's doing all those things. If she were to have, I, I'm assuming you had a good balance, or do you something no, you want to work on? Balance. I, I just broke my little toe. And okay. so that, was, that was maybe some of the shifting. Okay. Balance. Well, you, I mean, I, mean, I think that's way below. Just you hardly shifted at all. But even just something like that can impact it. So, all right. Who's what next? If, what if her arms were straight? Does that make a difference? It could. Is that standing on? It the could, but the point is really, it, it's not. I mean, take, you know, we can say here or there, but really, I'm just interested to see how well with the simple baseline test so that we know we can proceed on. If, if I see somebody that's just all over the place uh -huh. and they're like at 100 or something or they're at risk of falling with just this, then that means we need to probably get some medical clearance first and see if we have other issues going on. But if it's somebody that's pretty, you know, Ken did a great job of just standing there. He had a little more shifting going on, but that's something that can definitely improve. We get that better and that's the building blocks of it. All right, you ready? Let's see what you got. Go, Mary. You gotta be 15 now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so close. You guys will have to, we'll have, to have like a another competition. <laughs> She was 18, yeah, balance off. <laughs> so give me step off. So that that's great. So she's uh, again with the there's a there's a more involved test called the modified um, comprehensive test of sensory balance. And what it is is you have somebody with first they'll just do like that one. Then the second one be now next test I would have them do is eyes closed. So then you take away the eyes. Remember there's three balance systems. We get rid of those eyes. And now what happens is people that are very visually dominant. They start to go, ooh, here. Yeah. And, you know, another, I don't necessarily try this, but a good test is like I'll have patients in the clinic, we have a device hooked up into the ceiling, so, and, the, you know, a support system so that if they fall, they go three inches. But I'll have them walk and head turn mm. to force them not to use their eyes, because it's interesting what happens when you become very visually dominant. So you're walking and you're subconsciously focused on something, and someone says, hey, David, you're like, we go the opposite direction of the turn. 
So that's because we now have, this is our primary balance system. Our goal is to challenge each balance system. Remember that whole recipe we came up with, strength, range of motion? We gotta get all that stuff as the best it can be. And then we can say, okay, well, now here's my best balance. James, I gotta go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, if you, did good. you want to do your test? It? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got time for one more. All right. All right. Ready? Good. Face straight. Yes, ma'am. What are we going to All right, here we go. We're going to break the record. You ready? Okay. Maybe. Are you?